The middle-aged, dark-haired man stands in the control room, alone, except for the bodies of numerous armed guards strewn about the floor. He stares intently at the monitor in front of him. On screen, a woman with fiery red hair dashes out of a room that's marked laboratory. As she runs down the hallway towards the hangar bay, it almost looks as if her body itself is on fire. The man follows her with the camera controls and continues to watch the screens. Good. She's managed to escape the guards. I sure hope she's worth all this trouble. He shuts the monitor off, holsters his two pistols, and walks out the door. made it session two we didn't go up in flames no pun intended um but there's still plenty of time for that we're kind of in the thick of things right now that little cold opening that you heard was actually a move that is incorporated into the system called begin a session and that is something you can do when you're starting a new session to kind of add something interesting that you want to incorporate into the session. Um, there's a table you can roll on, or you can just pick something that you want to do. And so I went ahead and picked uh, an influential character is introduced or given new detail. If you remember back in sector creation, uh, we were supposed to come up with a connection in the sector and I put that off. I said I didn't want to do that because I really wasn't sure who the character was at that point yet. Um, and so I kind of wanted to put a pin in that. Um, and now I think is a good time to do it. So we have introduced into our narrative a mysterious, middle-aged, dark-haired man who is responsible for breaking T out of her stasis pod and out of her prison cell, her prison block. And he's watching her on the monitor. And then once he confirms that she's escaped the guards and out of danger, he leaves the control room. And so perhaps in this session, we'll have the opportunity to run into him. And we can add him to our connections and see what his motive is for uh, wanting to free T. I don't know. We'll have to play to find out. So let's go ahead and get back into the narrative and envision where we are from T's point of view. T is running as fast as she can down this corridor, this hallway. She's not even looking behind her to see whether or not the guards have recovered and are chasing her. She assumes that they're going to be doing that, and she needs to put as much space in between them and her as possible. At the same time, she's looking for some sort of sign that would point her in the direction of a way out. Like I said, probably a hangar bay. And considering this is a prison deep space station, there's almost certainly a hangar bay. I'm not even going to bother asking the Oracle. I'm going to say yes, there is. And so she runs for a few minutes and sees a sign. Maybe there's a picture of a ship and an arrow pointing to the left. She assumes that's to the, hang uh, that's to the hangar bay. And she goes in that direction. She arrives at the hangar bay, and it's this large room. Um, there's not much in it. There's probably some control panels, and 
just like the uh, the window in the laboratory, there's probably just like kind of a large opening that is protected by a force field. And there's probably like a control room uh, with a set of stairs that go up to the control room. And there probably needs to be a way to deactivate the force field from the control room. Um, or perhaps there's... Uh, something in the sh a ship that can send a signal that deactivates the force field. Um, and so the question then is, is there a force field that is, um, not a force field, is there a ship that is currently in the hangar? And I'm going to say almost certain, right? I mean, this is a prison, um, station they need to have ways to come and go get supplies bring in prisoners things like that so we're going to ask the oracle i'm going to say it's certain there's always the chance that there's not one right now but it's a question that we as the player don't have control over so we'll ask the oracle oracle is there a ship currently parked in the hangar yes there is okay so the next question then becomes what type of ship is in the hangar and there is an oracle for that and i'm looking at my reference guide page 58 it's a d100 table so let's go ahead and roll a d100 it's a 36. it's a hauler ship which is uh oh sorry no it's a hunter 36 is a hunter ship a stealthy attack ship so i imagine it is a ship that is used to maybe capture paragons. It's like a bounty hunter ship, right? Perhaps, or, or here's an idea. What if it's our mystery man's ship? I like that better. It's our mystery man's ship. He has docked his ship here as part of his um, mission by whatever organization has hired him to break T out of jail. And so it would make sense that a competent person like this would have a stealthy attack ship. So, all right, so let's envision it. It's this well-armed, well-equipped, um, well-maintained, um, medium-sized attack ship. It's got lasers. Um, beam weapons on it. It's got um, mu uh, munitions, cannons on it. Um, and it is big enough probably to carry a crew of like five people and a captain. So like a, like a, a typical adventuring party um, if this was a more traditional RPG. Um, and so... T kind of ducks behind a cargo crate and she looks to see if it's guarded in any way. Um, and let's ask the Oracle. Oracle, is the ship guarded? 50-50? Um, uh, I mean, there's a 50%. So, so we've already established that the mystery man has taken out some of the guards. We know some of the guards have... Um, are predisposed back in the laboratory. Um, so we'll say it's 50-50, um, that there is an actual uh, armed guards who are in the hangar right now. So Oracle, is the hangar guarded? No, it's not. Okay. So the mystery man has taken out whatever security was once here, and there is a clear straight path to this ship and so t says it's quiet too quiet but i'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth i wonder if i could get that thing going and she sneaks out from behind the crate and runs to the ship does she encounter does this guy does this mystery man come back um 
probably, right? Like, he's not going to let her take off with his ship. Um, let's put a pin in that right now. Let's ask the Oracle whether or not the ship is open. Like, she can just easily access it. Probably slim, right? He's not going to leave a ship. So let's say, Oracle, can she get out? Is, is the door to the ship unlocked? It's unlocked. Wow. Okay. So I guess because this mystery man was um, too busy kind of dealing with the security, he didn't have time to lock the ship. So T's going to go ahead and get on board. And she runs to the cockpit. And she doesn't know how she has this knowledge. But as she sits down in the cockpit, she instinctively kind of knows what to do. She knows what buttons kind of power up the engines. She knows what buttons kind of power up the E-drive and how the throttle and the yoke work. And she's confused about how she knows this, but she knows it. And at that point, she hears a voice from behind her. Trying to make off with my ship, are you? After everything I just did for you. She turns around. She raises her hand. What's left of the small amount of kind of fire energy she's harnessed, uh, she kind of condenses it into, uh, into her fist. Stay away! I won't let you take me back to that cell. I'm leaving with this ship. This middle-aged man comes into view. He puts his hands up. He's kind of rugged. Perhaps he's got a little bit of five o'clock shadow going. Um, hey, easy. I'm the one who helped you. Who do you think powered down your stasis pod? I'm here to rescue you. Pleasure to meet you. He, and he kind of waits for her to introduce herself. She kind of looks down at this lab uniform she's wearing with the letter T on it. She looks up to him and says, I, I guess my name's T. Catchy. Um, we need a name for this guy. Let's go to our oracles and pick a name. Uh, so we're going to go to our character oracles, and we're going to start rolling up a character right now. So let's do that. Let me show you how that works on um, the auger. So we go over here to game browser, characters, uh, mail, new character. And we get a whole bunch of different occupations. That you can pick from for it to randomly generate an NPC for you. Um, I'm gonna pick mercenary. That's the way I kind of envision this guy in my head. He's been he's a competent mercenary who's been hired by someone or some faction to bust T out of jail for some unknown reason. Um, so we'll pick that. And there we go. Like the look of it. Dark haired, middle aged, a little bit of a beard. Um, and so it gives you his traits. He's cynical. He's brave. His name is Mars Irvine. Um, Long-term goal, become an advisor for a powerful faction. This is basically slotting right into our story. His current task is to recover ancient technology from a dangerous ruin. So um, we will go with that, and we can always use the oracles in our book to kind of expand on this a little bit. So we'll accept him. Seems like a good NPC. Um, and I don't really need him on my map, so we'll just remove him from the map. And so that is our NPC. And he will go ahead and become a connection. He's going to be our connection. So if we come over here, we can add him to her connections. It says bond. We're going to go ahead and change that to a connection. I'm not exactly sure. Is there a way to... Oh, yeah, okay. 
toggle tracker. Okay, so now the question becomes, we have to set his rank. Let me grab my book real quick, and let me turn to that sector chapter and see um, about what the what the rules were for creating your connection. All right. So you get an automatic strong hit. You assume an automatic strong hit. So we give him a role and a rank. So his role is mercenary. I think we've already decided that. Um, if I go to my character role, I think that's one of the options. Yeah, mercenary. Okay, so he's a mercenary. You know, there's a whole bunch of other ones in the book too. So if you don't like him being a mercenary, you can actually just click it and automatically change. If we wanted to roll off the table, we could do that. But since mercenary fits our story, we'll just keep it the way it is. Alright, and so we automatically get a strong hit on this make connection because I'm tying this into creative to creating our sector. He's our connection. So he gets a rank. Um, so rank for a connection kind of asks us how big of an impact do we want this person to be in our story? Um, troublesome is like you know, maybe a person you do like one quest for, and then you and then you move on. He's not going to be a major part of the story. While extreme or epic is somebody who is going to be around for a while. So I'm not sure with this guy yet. So I'm going to set him for um, formidable, like just the middle of the road, um, and we'll see how it goes. Let's see if we can eventually make a connection with him, or sorry, create a bond with him. So, um, anytime he aids us on a move associated with their role, we get to add plus one to the move, and we get plus one momentum on a hit. So, we'll have to remember that. Um, okay, so we've already got kind of his goal, what he wants to do. Um, he's trying to recover some ancient technology. We're going to put a pin in that. We can always change that. Um, we don't have to take everything that this NPC generator generates for us. We can kind of pick and choose as we go. Okay. So, he has his hands up. And he says, hey, easy, easy. Uh, I'm a friend. I'm the one who got you out of there. Uh, my name's Mars. Mars Irvine. It's nice to meet you, T. Um, I would love to, you know, kind of stay and chat for a little bit, but um, those guys you knocked out over in the laboratory, I give them about 30 seconds until they're on us. Um, how about we uh, go ahead and get out of there? Uh, you're sitting in my seat. And T kind of looks this guy up and down, and she doesn't really have much of a choice at this point but to go along with him. So she kind of suppresses the fire energy, and she says, All right, get us out of here. But once we're in, once we're in space, you're answering some questions. Hey, easy, easy. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, but we're going to have to get out of here first. T gets up out of the seat, and Mars um, drops down to the sea, starts pressing some buttons. The door to his ship uh, closes. Um, the ship pressurizes. And just at that point, the uh, guards burst in with their rifles and begin firing onto the ship. Oh, geez, if you had just trusted me about 30 seconds quicker, we could have been out of here. Um, the gunner seat's right over there. Uh, do me a favor, the engines need about 30 seconds to power up. Go ahead and um, see if you can't uh, keep our friends a little busy. T nods, jumps into the co-pilot seat, turns on the weapon system, and takes control of one of the kind of underside uh, munition cannons. And she's going to make a move um, to probably face danger and see if she can fire um, this gun at these um, 
mercenaries to try to, you know, stop them from shooting down the ship before it even gets in the air. Um, let's take a look at the moves, see if there's not a better move. I'm not an expert in every single move. Um, so... Or we, I mean, we could take this opportunity to do a battle. Maybe we'll do that. How about that? We can resolve this whole battle with one roll. So we, this is a good... We haven't done this move yet. So instead of, like, entering the fray and, um, you know, building up a progress track so that we can end the fight and escape, how about we go ahead and um, just use the move battle. When you fight a battle and it happens in a blur... Envision our objective and roll. And so what we're doing is we're envisioning us kind of getting onto the weapon systems. And while Mars is getting the engines for his ship kind of up and running and getting the force field down um, so that the ship can actually take off, T is going to use the weapon systems to try to uh, dispatch the guards who are shooting at the ship. Um and so she's probably fighting at range. Um, she's using the guns on the ship to shoot at range. Um, yeah, I don't think it's courage, leadership, or anything like that. She's not really in that kind of situation. Um, fighting, it, it could be iron, fighting close to overpower your foes. That's definitely not shadow. I don't think it's tactic. So we're either doing our best stat edge or our worst stat iron. Um, let's, we're going to go into edge. I mean, we're, we're using these guns to fire at these people and it's, and we're going to kind of be precise because we got these big guns targeting these kind of smaller people. So let's go ahead and roll plus edge. It's a weak hit. Okay. So you achieve your objective, but not without a cost. Pay the price. All right. So I think I know where we can go with this. So... T gets into the weapons chair and begins firing um, at the guards, but she is way out of practice when it comes to this. I mean, she kind of instinctively knows how to do it, but she's not very um, precise, and she's kind of overcompensating, not really being accurate, and she's just spraying gunfire kind of all over the hangar. And unfortunately, she does take out a couple of the guards, but unfortunately, what she also does is kind of destroys the consoles that um, that operate the force field. And Mars, you know, as he's lifting the ship up into the air and um, kind of trying to escape the hangar the force feels like flickering on and off and he just kind of has to gun it kind of right out and it uh kind of messes up with the ship scrambles like kind of its um electronics as it kind of flies through this force field and and into space and as he engages the e-drive to kind of jump into hyperspace um the calculations from the computer um, kind of malfunction at the last minute, and it kind of short circuits the E drive. Um, and he's like, "Oh shoot!" Um, and then they're in the drift. And Mars looks over at T and was like, "You think you could be a little more careful with where you're spraying that gunfire?" Um, I have no idea where we're going to pop out of the drift. Um, that little maneuver you did scrambled the E-Drive. I was hoping to get us to a uh, safe location, but now I'm not sure where we're going to pop out. We could pop out in the middle of a black hole. Um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And she says, hey... Look, I woke up like 15 minutes ago, man. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. You haven't even told me, you know, why you rescued me or who, you know, who you're working for or, or what this is all about. And he goes, well, we got a couple hours before we pop out of the drift in a random place. And I guess we might as well chat. Come on. Let's go to the uh, galley. Follow me.
and he gets out of the gunner seat and kind of follows him as he puts the the uh, the ship. You know, he sets the ship to autopilot. I mean, they're 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 flying through the drift right now, which is like the if this was Star Wars, it'd be hyperspace. And you know, he, he's looking down at the the controls and he. He says, I, I don't know where we're going to pop out of the drift, so we might as well get to know each other, because if we pop out in the middle of a star, at least you can say you made a new friend before you died. Come on. And they both walk out of the cockpit and head to the gallery. All right, so let's update some of our paperwork. Um, we're going to go ahead and make progress in our current vow, I will escape the prison. That was obviously getting out of the hangar and into space and into the drift was a pretty big milestone towards getting out of here. I'm going to wait until after we do this role play scene with him and we pop out of the drift. And at that point, I will roll to finish the vow. And if we get a weak hit or a miss, then we'll have to incorporate the prison um, into the narrative as to why we didn't successfully complete that vow. But we've got a good chance of completing it, and if we do complete it, then we can kind of move on to our next story beat. So that'll be the plan. The T follows Mars to the kind of rest area of the ship, the living quarters, where there's maybe some chairs, a couch, a table, a little kitchenette, and she sits down in one of the chairs while Mars kind of puts his feet up on the table and plops down onto another chair. And he says, all right, spill. Any idea why they want you so badly? And he looks at him and kind of cocks her head and says, I don't even know who I am or who you're talking about. And I'm the one asking the questions here. Who are you? Who are you working for? Why did you rescue me? And he kind of leans back on two legs of his chair. Says, look, I'm just a mercenary for hire. Um, and a job came along that I just couldn't refused. The pay was too good. They wanted me to rescue you. Who's they? Uh, and I guess now's a, a good opportunity to ask the Oracle some questions. Does Mars know who his employer is? Um, or is it a uh, kind of a secret faction who's hired him through proxies? Let's ask. Uh, we'll say 50-50. I really don't know. Does Mars know who his employer is? No, he doesn't. Okay. Look, I don't even know who it is that actually hired me. I just got a contract through the channel, if you know what I mean. I don't. Please, enlighten me. When you're part of the Mercenaries Guild and employers want to remain anonymous... They send contracts through, we call it the channel. It's a uh, part of the weave uh, that only mercenaries know how to access. And you can scout for jobs on there. And they don't, and there's a special section for particularly dangerous jobs that pay a lot of credits, but uh, with employers who aren't necessarily willing to. Um, disclose everything about themselves, if you know what I mean. Uh, off the books type, uh, type people. All I know is I was supposed to deliver a prisoner that was being held in, I guess we gotta figure out a name for this prison station. Uh, why don't we, uh, why don't we make a dungeon? Uh, derelict station. Okay, we'll take that. Uh, Proxima Citadel. All I know was the job was to bust a prisoner out of Proxima Citadel. Uh, a particular prisoner in cell block B, 22, stasis pod 9. And 
that was you. My job is to take you to their base and uh, at these coordinates. And he pulls up a data pad and it has particular coordinates on it. Um, all I know is that once I get you to these coordinates, I get a big fat paycheck and everybody wins. You're no longer being held in captivity. I can uh, finally pay off this old bucket of bolts and he kind of slaps the table and this mysterious organization who wants you well they're happy too so we good you gonna cooperate with this and looks at him and says no i'm not gonna cooperate with this i'm not going to some mysterious organization i don't know who i am or who or where i am i need to i need to figure out all of that. Well, clearly you're a paragon. What's a paragon? Paragon, you know, people with powers. Really super rare. Because I have no idea what you're talking about. I saw you on the video monitor. The way you blasted that door down where, where your whole body was engulfed in flames. Uh, girl, normal people can't do that. Well, if there's anything I've learned, I'm not exactly 100% normal. Look, let's just jump out of the drift, find the nearest station, and make sure that the ship is okay, and then we can talk about what exactly it is you want to do. But I'm telling you, I'd like to do this the easy way instead of the hard way. And it wouldn't exactly be easy for a Paragon to just be randomly running around through the sector. Uh, you're much safer with me. And if this organization turns out to be shady, well, it's very clear you can handle yourself. Anyway, uh, we should be dropping out of the drift here pretty soon. I'm going to go ahead and head back to the cockpit. Uh, make yourself at home. And he gets up and just kind of leaves T in complete shock at what she's just heard. And she kind of sits alone in the galley of the ship. As, and really just tries to rack her brain and think, what is going on here? Who wants me so badly that they'd hire this guy to bust me out of some high security prison? And paragons? And why can't I remember anything about before? have to take this one step at a time. I hope that Oaf knows how to fly a ship. And she uh, jumps up from her chair and follows him into the cockpit. All right. So did we make any progress on establishing a bond with this guy? Um, let me take a look at the bond moves again. Forge a bond. I think it's... Um, I think it's something about, it's like a connection move. I like it lets you increase your bonds. Uh, connection move. Uh, develop your relationship. All right, we definitely didn't swear a vow. We didn't complete a quest. We didn't leverage their help. Didn't give them, I mean, did we share a profound moment? Yeah, we'll mark progress. I'm a, I'm a fan of marking progress whenever you have a meaningful scene with an NPC. And he's formidable, so it's going to take us a while. So I envision this as like, okay, we've introduced ourselves. We know, we've learned something about him. He is doing this for money. He's in debt. He's like a Han Solo type mercenary who probably is in over his head on this ship. And he's trying to pay it off by taking really high-risk merc jobs. So we'll go ahead and mark progress on our bond with him. All right, so what's next in the story? Let's go ahead and roll on our whether or not we escaped from the prison. So we will try to complete this vow. We hit. So let's take a look at what that says for... 
a complete val. Um, I forget what it is. I'll take decisive action. It is a quest move. Uh, fulfill your val. Yeah. All right. On a weak hit, so we so roll the challenge die compared to okay. A strong hit, your vow is fulfilled. Mark a reward in your quote. Okay, so we didn't do that. On a weak hit, as above, but there is more to be done, or you realize the truth of your quest. If you swear an iron vow to set things right, take your full legacy reward. Otherwise, make the rank. Okay. So one rank lower would be nothing. So we are going to, there's more to be done. Um, I want to get the progress for this. We're just going to have to kind of establish it in the narrative as we go along. So I won't take the, um, I won't take the progress on my quest legacy track until we swear the next vow. But we have completed the quest to escape from Proxima Citadel. And... Clearly, T is going to be wanted. She's an outcast. She's a fugitive. She's on the run from whatever this organization is. But I think we probably need to kind of flesh out what Proxima Citadel is. Like, who these people are who are keeping her hostage. And T doesn't necessarily know this, but us as a GM would know this. And so, there's really two options it's either like the government, right, who has uh, incarcerated her for some unknown reason and is experimenting on her, or it's some other group, um, some third-party faction who has some sort of fascination with Paragons. And so when, you have, when you're trying to choose between two, you pick one of them as likely. What would be more interesting for the story? T being on the run from the government or some third party faction? I like the government idea, right? Like she's an outcast fugitive. That would make sense, especially with our assets. All right, so we'll ask the Oracle. Is it the government she's on the run for from or is it some other third party faction? And we'll say it's likely it's the government. No, it's not. Okay. The dice taketh away. So it is a third-party faction. So some unknown group is hunting down Paragons. Could it be the organization, these religious zealots who've come to the sector? Could it be that there's some newfound religion that's sweeping the uh, forge? And it's like they believe that Paragons are the devil, and they need to be exterminated and cleansed from the galaxy. So that's that's what it'll be. It'll be that it'll be some new religious faction, that, and that'll tie back into our sector creation when we're figuring out what our sector trouble is. All right. So she's on the run from this organization. They have this private prison kind of set up over here, up in the uh, up in the top of the sector. And so the ship comes out of the drift. And the panel kind of lights up red. And Mars is typing away. And he says, well, you want the good news or the bad news, T? I guess give me the bad news first. I'd rather have some sense of good feelings after I'm done hearing everything. The bad news, our E-Drive is shot. We're not going to be able to make another jump into the drift until we get it fixed. Um, something about flying through that force field must have really messed with it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not the greatest mechanic. Probably above my pay grade. So we're stranded, floating through space, with no means of hyperspace travel. You wanted the bad news, but are you ready for the good news? Our sublight engines can get us to Palisade. Uh, we'll be we'll be able to tra uh, set down there and find someone to fix the ship. 
but I'm going to need your help. Palisade is not exactly the most uh, open-armed, welcoming type place. What do you mean? Well, it's a deep space station that people go to disappear, to gamble, to drink, to engage in all kinds of shady underworld dealings. So, it's not like we could just go knock on the door and find a mechanic. Look, I know you're not too keen on me delivering you to whoever my employer is. But the way I see it, whether or not you're going to go along with that or not, you can't just uh, be dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Um, let's at least stick together until the ship is fixed. And once we get the ship fixed, if you're really, really, really opposed, then we can talk about it. But it doesn't serve either of us any good to be stranded in the middle of nowhere with a busted engine next to a station that's full of crime. So, how about you swear that you'll help me fix the ship, and then I'll swear to you that we can sit down and figure out what the next step is. What do you say? And he kind of flips her a coin an iron coin, and she catches it in midair. Oh, that's right. Just woke up. You forgot. Uh, in the forge, when people swear something, they do it on iron. She kind of holds the coin in the air. She looks at Mars, who kind of gives her a half smile. She kind of looks at this beat-up attack ship that is probably, like, hanging by a thread. I don't really have much of a choice, do I? It's either that, or I'm stranded in a lab coat, or lab outfit, in a criminal deep space station. You really haven't given me many appealing options. Fine. I swear I'll help you fix the ship. And we will go ahead and swear an iron vow. Um, do... Swear and Iron Vow. All right, we roll plus heart. And we're doing it to a connection, so we get plus one. I think that's how that works, right? Um, exploration Club References. Um, um, it says whenever you make a roll that is clearly associated, or a move that's clearly associated with their roll. You get a plus one. I thought that there was somewhere in the book that said that when you um, when you swear an iron vow to a connection, maybe it's a bond. Uh, but, I mean, this is associated with his role. He's a mercenary. He's trying to get leverage our help to kind of get his ship fixed. And I don't know whether or not he's going to betray us or not or what the situation is. But I'm going I'm to take the plus one. I'm going to roll plus heart. And it's a weak hit. You're determined to begin your quest. Or you're determined to begin your quest with more questions and answers. Take plus one momentum. All right, we're all momentum is maxed or close to maxed. So we're going to need that. So the ship uh, approaches Palisade, which is this kind of orbital, circular, deep space station. Um, and Mars types in the request for a landing bay, he gets approved, and the ship touches down onto landing dock 39. And she says, okay, well, what's the, uh, what's the plan? And he said, kind of looks at his shoulder and shrugs and goes, uh, -huh. that's your job. I got to do some, um, I'm, gonna, I'm staying here with the ship. Your job is to go out there and figure out, um, find a, find some sort of person who can help repair the ship. Would he do that? Would he send her out on her own? I mean, she's pretty important. No, he probably wouldn't. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna back that up. 
So scratch that, and you can any you can do that when you're solo role playing. Anytime something comes out of your mouth or in your head, and it's like that doesn't feel right, you can absolutely rewind. And so, okay, so we'll rewind. They touch down, and he's and and she says, okay. So what do we do? He shrugs his shoulders, says, I don't know. How about we hit the uh, hit the station and see if we can track down a somebody who can fix the E drive. Ask some questions. Gather some information. And she says, All right, I guess I'm following your lead. I don't know much about this place. Yeah, I think we're going to have to kind of get the lay of the land a little bit. Let's find a bar, grab a drink. Maybe the bartender might know. You say so. And the two of them uh, exit the ship onto the docking bay, close up the ship behind them and begin walking deeper into the station. We'll end the session there as the scene shifts to our first scene in Palisade. T was able to escape the prison. We've determined that it was called Proxima Citadel and that some unknown faction, some religious cult is hunting down paragons and capturing them and doing experiments and some other unknown organization or faction has hired Mars to rescue T for some reason. Her specifically, specifically her, her um, cell and stasis pod was what was requested of Mars. So we know it's not just a, a general paragon, it's T specifically. Um, why don't we go ahead and, so we're done with this vow. Why don't we also go ahead and mark progress and discover who I am? Just one little tick, because she's learned that she's a paragon, and so she's gained meaningful insight into who she is. Um, and we are now on a quest with Mars to um, fix the ship, so that they can go to the, either these coordinates or T. Or, or no, she's not quite sure whether or not she's going to cooperate with this, but she does know she can't just be left stranded in the middle of a space station with a broken ship. And she's also not the type of person who's just going to attack and steal and strand somebody who rescued her. She's not an evil person like that. So she's kind of in between a rock and a hard place and is just kind of going with the flow right now. We'll see whether or not she ultimately decides to go along with this whole take me to the sector coordinates or not. But we'll do that in a future episode. All right. Thanks, guys. Hope everybody had a good time and enjoyed it. I'll see you next time on our actual play Ironsworn Starforge campaign. Take care.